y'all, Dixie here. Today I want to talk to you about a question that I have received a lot, especially now that I have completed the Appalachian Trail, Pacific Crest Trail, and the Continental Divide Trail, and that is people always ask me, which trail should I through hike? I want to go ahead and give you a very simple answer today if you're wondering that question, and the simple answer is, it depends. It's not an easy answer, but it is a very simple one because it really does depend. It depends on your personal preferences, why you're through hiking in the first place. It depends on maybe your experience level. I don't know each individual watching this video, so I can't give you, you know, the exact name of one of those trails and tell you that it's right for you. But what I can do is kind of run through some considerations to help you maybe differentiate, you know, what do I really want out of a trail and um, what are some things to consider if I'm going to hike a certain trail and then you can apply that to yourself but when I go through some of these points I invite you to be honest with yourself because I know that watching somebody else doing something or um, maybe reading a blog of somebody that did a certain trail um, whether it was a really good or maybe not the experience that they thought they were gonna have you know, that might not be how it is for you so you might be surprised going through some of this and you might not but anyway these are just some things to think about when you're trying to decide which through hike is right for me first things first do you like people or do you prefer you know dogs or do you really value your solitude that's certainly something to think about when you're trying to decide between AT PCT and CDT so just to cover them a little bit one by one the AT has millions of people on it each year. Now that's not millions of folks through hiking. Uh, it's just millions of people who are doing day hikes, section hikes, weekend hikes, or through hikes. So there are a lot of people out there. So if you're gonna through hike the AT, you're gonna see a lot of people, whether that's through hikers or not. In 2017, almost a thousand people reported to have completed a through hike of the AT. Now that's including northbounders, southbounders, and flip-floppers. So that's the direction in which they start their hike. Considering that 20 to 30% of people actually finish, that means that there were a lot more people who were attempting a through hike at the beginning of the season. On the AT also, people tend to group up in the way that they camp. So there are shelters along the AT, which are usually three-sided structures that have you know, some kind of wooden floor in them and people can just roll their sleeping pads out and all kind of sleep in there together. Some of them are two-storied, some of them one-storied, you know, they're all sorts of different shapes and sizes. Also at these shelters, you have people who camp around. The shelters are generally a good spot to camp because they have everything you need, usually a water source, a privy, and then again, you know, especially if it's raining, that shelter structure. So if you look at the numbers for the PCT, the PCTA says that hundreds of thousands of people are on the PCT each year, uh, potentially millions, but again, these are people who are just out there they aren't people who are through hiking. The PCTA tends to collect their data a little bit different, but they show that over 6,000 people got a permit for the year 2017, and it seems about 500 or so finished. Now in 2018, that was actually up to 1,000, and I'm gonna guess that that's because 2017 was a really high snow year, so you know that shows that weather on the PCT, which we'll get into later, um, can kind of fluctuate the numbers, but you've got a good number of people on the PCT also. You know, there's this um, big belief that there are way less people on the PCT, and in some years that may be true, again, due to weather. Um, but again, that is a lot of folks finishing a through hike. I doubt that 6,000 actually started um, because most of the time not 100% of the people who get a permit begin the trail. Um, but showing that in 2018 about a thousand people have reported uh, completing the trail, you know, that's that's a pretty big number and pretty similar to the numbers that were seen on the AT in 2017 the year prior. Now on the PCT for the most part there aren't shelters like on the AT. You know on the AT those are present every I would say on average 10 to 20 miles. On the PCT, you can probably count on one hand the number of structures that you can sleep in. Um, so you don't have that same bottleneck effect where you've got a bunch of people huddled up in one spot. Uh, the camping is a little bit more dispersed. Yes, there are still some you know, more established um, spots, but again, they're not at a shelter where everyone's kind of aiming to get to. According to Wikipedia, only about 200 people attempt to through hike the Continental Divide Trail in a year. Now. I'm not exactly sure how many people touch it. I, I really couldn't find any numbers for how many folks who are, you know, on it annually. 
um, whether for section day hike, etc. But I'm thinking even with the traffic from the Colorado Trail where it intersects the CDT and the fact that people are so active in Colorado and kind of out on the trails, you know, mountain biking um, and all the hunters in Wyoming and Montana and even Colorado and New Mexico. I'm thinking that even with all of that, there are significantly less people on the CDT. As far as camping goes on the CDT, there is no real designated camping area. I mean, sometimes you're going through state parks or, you know, very well established areas, um, but that is not the majority of the time. A lot of times you're just happy to find a flat spot when you do. Even in the gut hook app on the AT and the PCT, there are some um, waypoints that kind of tell you like, this might be a good camping area or this area will fit so many tents. Uh, on the CDT, that doesn't really happen. Sometimes people will mention it in the comments just to kind of help one another out because there really aren't, um, you know, prime real estate spots on the CDT like the other two trails. So uh, you definitely don't have to worry about those huddled up places. And honestly, the CDT can sometimes be lonely enough that, that you appreciate having somebody else around you. So if you're one of those people who doesn't really want to be around people and you value your solitude, then the CDT might be right for you. However, I am not saying to avoid the AT and PCT at all costs, because if you look at the numbers, you can really see that there are significantly less people heading in a southbound direction. And then also if you're on the AT even and going northbound with a lot of people, if you avoid those shelters and just make a point to not camp where most people are going to be huddled up, then you're likely to not have folks just forced down your throat. And even on the AT and PCT with there being a lot more folks than on the CDT, nobody is going to hold you against your will and, you know, make you talk to them. So for the most part, people seem to be pretty respectful and can more or less pick up on like, hey, this person might just want to enjoy some alone time with nature and uh, seem to be a little more self-aware because they probably too value their solitude and that relationship with nature. But something to consider with there being a lot of people is there are safety in numbers. Now, <laughs> I say that, but there have been 11 murders on the Appalachian Trail and there have been zero murders so far, knock on wood, on the PCT and CDT is far as I can tell, or, you know, as far as I can tell through research. Um, so, you know, yes, there are a lot more people who have been on the Appalachian Trail and it was founded or, you know, created, finished in 1925. And then the Pacific Crest Trail in 1970 and the CDT in 1972. So um, to be fair, the other trails haven't been around as long. So when you consider that there are millions of people who are on the Appalachian Trail each year and there have only been 11 murders since its creation in 1925, you know, it's not doing too bad statistically. But you know, it is a nice feeling to know that if you were injured or um, were having a tough time or lost something or needed something, you know, on the other two trails, there are going to be people around or say you freeze your filter on accident. You know, you can always borrow one from somebody. I know it's not a good idea to depend on people. I'm, I'm not saying to do that, but I'm just saying, you know, if something bad were to happen for me, it was a comforting feeling to know that on my first through hike, there would be people around. And also with more people to me comes more of a community and more of a culture. And for example, on the Appalachian Trail, you know, you've got a whole lot of culture there, the people of the Appalachian Mountains, you've got the Civil War history, um, just all sorts of stuff. And there is some of that also on the PCT and the CDT, but I just felt more of that on the AT. And then there is trail magic. So where there are people, the trail angels will come. Now I'm not selling short the trail angels on the Pacific Crest Trail or the Continental Divide Trail, although there really weren't a whole lot on the CDT, um, more so for sure on the PCT. But again, that's kind of a reflection of how many people you have out there hiking, how many people have done it in the past that want to come pay it forward, and just the general awareness of the trail. Another big concern of people who are trying to decide which trail to hike is how developed is each trail? So the Appalachian Trail is, you know, very apparent. You've got white blazes marking the way and it's just not real easy to get lost. Now on the Pacific Crest Trail, things can get a little hairy when you have a lot of snow in the Sierra Nevada. I can't speak for an average snow year, but I can tell you that in a very high snow year, um, and honestly, when I'm walking in the snow anyway, I like to have Gut Hook, so the GPS app. I didn't feel like I needed that on the Appalachian Trail. It was just um, AWOL's guide was all that I used, 
and I got turned around a few times, but it was real easy to get back. I got turned around like on another trail. On the Pacific Crest Trail, if I didn't have gut hook, I probably um, could have gotten lost when I was in the snow in the Sierra Nevada. On the rest of the trail though, again, pretty much a highway, marked pretty well with the PCT blazes. Now on the CDT, it's much easier to get lost. Things were not very well marked. Um, there were some blazes, of course, and I know that the volunteers with the CDTC are doing a really good job of trying to get people to donate money so that they can put more blazing on trees to kind of help guide folks. Um, but there were areas where it was pretty confusing. You might have blazes in both directions because they've rerouted the trail and didn't take down the old blazes. Um, you can just tell that it is not near as developed. Now, I will say that I had always heard, I won't say horror stories, but I had heard oh my gosh, the CDT isn't as um, developed and it's only 70% finished. And, you know, I just heard um, all these things that made me think that if I didn't have a map and a compass, I was going to be lost and die in the wilderness. And that just really uh, isn't the case. I think what, for the most part, they mean by it isn't completely developed yet is that the trail isn't quite routed the way that they want it to go yet. So a lot of times you're on dirt roads or even paved roads or at times yes going through some brush especially in the desert where you're following fence posts uh, but for the most part it's not just you're out in the middle of this thick brush you know and you have to use a map and compass or else um, i'm going to be honest i did not use a map and compass for any of the three triple crown trails now i'm not telling you that you should not take it as a backup um, or that it couldn't be helpful you know if somebody was in a tight spot if they knew how to use it um, but I'm just telling you that by using gut hooks on the PCT and CDT, even in those hairy spots, I was able to get out using that that went through my GPS. And on the CDT, I did have a backup, um, which was my inReach because it has topo maps on there and actually had um, the trail marks with a little tick line on uh, the inReach map also. I know I made it sound like having a highway was um, positive and things being less developed, you know, even underdeveloped, if you want to call it that, on the CDT um, was negative. But to be honest, I really actually enjoyed that part of the CDT because there were places where I would walk and I'm like, wow, it doesn't look like thousands and thousands and thousands of people have walked through here before. And that's just, I don't know, that's kind of exciting. Also, if you're one of those create your own adventure kind of people, the CDT has so much of that. So on the Appalachian Trail, for example, it's, you know, white blazes. There are a few blue blaze alternates that you can take, but most people just um, stick to the true, you know, white blaze path. Now on the PCT, there are a lot more approved alternates. So um, there's like Mount San Jacinto in California. There's an alternate where you get to see more of Crater Lake instead of the official PCT, which really doesn't go around it. Um, and then on and on, you know, there are just several different alternates that allow you to see things that might be more beautiful. But on the CDT, you can just like create whatever you want. According to the CDTC, a through hike of the CDT means that you're walking from Mexico to Canada or Canada to Mexico, and you have a continuous footpath. So your footsteps connect and you stay within 50 miles of the geological divide. Then you through hike the CDT. So. Um, I don't know, I found that pretty exciting and there are all sorts of different alternates along the way and um, again, you know, creating your own path is approved of. Um, so I, I just really found the CDT to be fun in that way um, that the PCT and AT just weren't because that was more of a designated, you know, this is the path kind of thing. Now let's talk about difficulty of terrain. So on the Appalachian Trail, you've got elevation gains, losses of 515,000 feet. But the highest point on the Appalachian Trail is at about 6,600 feet, and that's Clingman's Dome. On the PCT, you're looking at elevation gains and losses of 315,000 feet, and the highest point is at Forrester Pass, which is just a little over 13,000 feet. And on the CDT, there are 400,000 feet of elevation gains and losses, and the highest point of the CDT is at Gray's Peak, which is about 14,300 feet. So it's kind of all over the spectrum there. You know, the AT is more up and down and up and down or what people call PUDs, which is pointless up and downs. Sometimes on the AT, you're even gonna have hand over hand climbing. 
There are ladders placed in certain areas to help people get up and over rock formations and you just kind of never know what you're gonna get. But the AT is foot traffic only, whereas the PCT is more graded for livestock. So it's much more gradual, you've got more switchbacks, but you are at higher elevations. And then on the CDT, it's kind of middle ground between uh, the PCT and AT as far as elevation change. Um, but you are at even higher elevations with the trail going up and over a 14er in Colorado. So I'll have folks ask like, well, if my knees are bad, um, should I do a different trail than the Appalachian Trail? I mean, maybe, you know, it really depends on your physical capabilities. Um, I have seen people on the Appalachian Trail hiking in their 70s. People in their 80s have even through hiked it and the same goes for the other trails. The bottom line is if you take it slow, you start in the best physical condition you can um, and you just kind of listen to your body along the way, you are going to slowly adjust. I think the biggest mistake that people make is just getting out there, you know, running out of the gates, feeling like they have something to prove, and then they're injured and laying up for two days in, you know, Mount Laguna because they did too many miles and hurt their knees. That's me on the Pacific Crest Trail. So, you know, I speak from experience when I say you just have to take it slow. And I mean, if you know truly that your knees are an issue, then sure, you might want to consider the PCT. But I'm just saying don't toss away the AT completely um, just because you think that's going to be an issue for you, you know. So um, I think the most important thing, like I said, is truly taking it slow and listening to your body. Something that I highly considered before I started through hiking was what is the wildlife like? So before I started the AT, the PCT, and CDT, on all three of them, I was concerned about some particular thing as far as wildlife goes. So on the AT, um, I was pretty nervous about the idea of seeing a bear. And then I handled the first bear encounter all wrong and ended up getting bluff charged by a black bear in Virginia. Um, but I saw several more bears after that and handled them very well and, you know, lived to tell about it. So, um, you know, black bears were kind of my biggest thing. Now on the AT, you also have venomous snakes and sure there might be other animals that are a bit scary. Um, but on the PCT, you can pretty much have all of those things and then add in mountain lions. Now, for some reason, I wasn't really worried about the mountain lions. I was really afraid of uh, seeing rattlesnakes and I did, I saw 10 of them actually. Um, so, you know, but I didn't, I didn't have any encounters with the mountain lions on the PCT, but, but you are adding in mountain lions and that is, you know, another thing to think about. And then on the CDT, you have all of those animals from the AT and the PCT. And now you also have grizzly bears when you get further up north. And I know some of y'all are like, well, Dixie, there have been cougar satins on the AT, or, you know, there is a chance that the grizzlies are living in the Cascades and um, Washington, you know, yes. Like, but I'm saying as a whole, um, you know, things, to consider the, the likelihood of seeing a grizzly bear on the PCT, I feel like is much lower than, you know, on the CDT. But regardless, there are ways to mitigate your interactions with wildlife. But, you know, if you're already nervous about um, something else that really bothers you about the CDT and then also grizzly bears, well then you might wanna look into the PCT or the AT instead. It's just something to consider and you know what you personally feel comfortable with. For me, I kind of liked the idea of slowly leveling up with um, the wildlife I was gonna experience and you know it did end up working out best for me that way. Let's talk about water. So on the Appalachian Trail, you pretty much don't ever have to be worried about water. And that's because it rains a whole lot out there. I would say on the AT that at least every four miles, you're probably gonna run across a water source. I think if I remember correctly, the longest stretch that I had to worry about water on the AT was approximately 10 miles or so. Um, whereas on the PCT and CDT, going 10 miles is very normal from water source to water source. On the Pacific Crest Trail, you are going through 700 miles of desert to start with. Um, and then once you hit the Sierra Nevada, you don't have to worry about water. Northern California, it gets a little hairy again, but then in most of Oregon and pretty much all of Washington, you're probably good on water. On the Continental Divide Trail, you might have water. And I don't recall there being any stretches that were longer than what I experienced on the PCT as far as not having water. Um, 
but I will say that the quality of water on the CDT is the worst that I've ever experienced. Not the whole CDT. Um, there are certainly some places on the CDT that have prettier, more pristine water than on all of the Appalachian Trail, probably. Um, but the cow ponds and, you know, the, the sources where not just the cows are drinking out of it, but they're actually like peeing and pooping in the water. You know, it's, it's pretty gross. So you do get a lot of that on the CDT. Although the cistern that had the dead cat or dead rabbit or whatever that creature was um, on the PCT <laughs> might be a little bit more gross than the cow pond water on the, the CDT. I don't know. Um, but again, I think if I recall correctly that on the CDT, I didn't have to go as long as on the PCT. So, you know, if you're not real comfortable with the idea of dry camping, which is where you're setting up camp, um, without being right near a water source, then the AT might be for you. You know, it just really kind of depends, again, on your personal preference and what you feel comfortable with. So I mentioned that on the AT there is more water due to rain. So that is definitely something to consider on these city trails, right? Weather. On the Appalachian Trail, there is a lot of rain, but you're also in a green tunnel most of the way until you hit like New Hampshire. That's really the first area that I recall being like, wow, this is really exposed. Um, but for the PCT and the CDT, it is completely normal to be exposed. And I really noticed that when we first hit the desert on the PCT starting out, I was like, where do you hide in this? Like, this is like, I feel naked out here. Just anybody could see me from very far away. And, um, you know, having to go to the bathroom and hide behind bushes and, and stuff like that, you know, just or hide behind cactus even. Um, but, you know, so that, that is a big thing um, to kind of get used to. Um, either way, you know, if you're used to being in exposed areas and then you go um, to the green tunnel, you might feel claustrophobic. With exposure comes weather also. So yes, AT, you're going to get a lot more rain, but you're kind of shielded more from the wind. Um, on the PCT and the CDT, when you're starting out in the desert, you've got to deal with that sun just beating down on you and the wind, you know, you don't really have anywhere to hide from that. So that's definitely something that I found to be a bit maddening when it lasted more than a day or so. And then the temperatures aren't, you know, as regulated or as consistent. You might have a really hot day during the day in the desert and then at night it might be freezing cold and, you know, your water filter freezes in the middle of the night because you didn't expect it to get that cold. So you kind of always have to be a bit more prepared for kind of anything out on the PCT and CDT. On the CDT in Colorado, the thunderstorms are pretty horrendous. It seemed like no matter what I did, whenever I hit a peak in Colorado, lightning was gonna happen or the black clouds were gonna roll in and at least threaten it, you know, having me worried about it the whole time. And, you know, I did have one of the scariest experiences I've ever had um, with my hair standing straight up and um, it was an electrifying moment. I did experience a pretty close lightning strike also on the Appalachian Trail. So, you know, weather is something that you're gonna have to deal with in general, but it just seemed that, you know, I dealt with rain a lot more on the AT, um, pretty hot, uh, sun and, and wind on the PCT and also those things on the CDT, um, but throw in those lightning storms a little bit heavier on the CDT. So again, you always kind of have to be prepared for that what if with temperature and weather. Although the Appalachian Trail does get a lot of rain, one of the things that I really enjoyed about it is that in the summertime it gets warm and it pretty much stays warm. Now, yes, it stays like really hot and sweaty too, um, but you can lighten your base weight so much in the summertime on the AT. I ended up sleeping in just a fleece liner, like a, a fleece liner that people might use to line their sleeping bag um, on the AT pretty much for most of the heat of the summer because it was just warm enough that I didn't need more than that. Whereas on the PCT and CDT, I had a 10 degree bag and I was most of the time happy with that. There might've been a few nights where I wish I'd had a little bit warmer of a bag and I am a very cold sleeper. So um, again, you know, it's really nice on the AT being able to lighten your load during the summertime where on the PCT and CDT, I would never have risked that. Another thing I noticed as far as weather goes with the CDT is we got snowed on more on the CDT as far as per each month. So for each month we were out there, we got snowed on at some point more than not. So I think we got snowed on like four of the six months we were out there. It wasn't like crazy falling down and, and heavily collecting um, until really towards the end. But at some point each month almost we got snowed on. Something else to consider is natural disasters. And specifically what I mean by this is wildfires. So 
it does happen on the Appalachian Trail. In fact, I think in, was it 2016 or 2017? I know that there were those fires, especially near Gatlinburg and um, in the Smokies area. Um, but on the Pacific Crest Trail and the Continental Divide Trail, it is much more common to be affected by wildfires. And I don't mean that, oh, there's a big likelihood that you're gonna you know, burn to death in your tent at night or anything like that. Um, but you do have to deal with some of those logistics. So if there is a wildfire, you have to decide, am I going to create an alternate footpath around it? And on the CDT, that's exactly um, what I did. Now on the Pacific Crest Trail, there were so many fires that I ended up just going around. So, you know, I made sure I touched the southern end of the boundary of the fire closure and the northern end of the boundary. And that was um, sometimes not real convenient to do. And I had to rely on trail angels to kind of shuttle around and things like that. Sometimes had to pay for shuttles, um, but I was determined to hike every single open mile of the PCT. And um, for their considerations, you know, that was a through hike. So um, next summer I'll be going out to fill in those closures, but um, it's just something to consider, you know, if, um, if you want to deal with that logistically, or are you just going to get frustrated and say, forget it and, you know, start skipping a lot of miles and, you know, just something to think about um, on the Appalachian Trail. You don't generally have to do that. And it's more common to be able to hike from point A to point B and, you know, finish the trail in its entirety. And then yes, of course, there is potentially a safety issue with the fires and breathing smoke. And, you know, do you want some of your experience, especially if you're going out there for the epic views, you know, you can have sometimes where you aren't really able to see anything for the smoke. So um, again, not something that's necessarily a deal breaker, but just something to consider. But one little aspect uh, that I enjoyed about the AT, that I didn't get on the other two trails was little victories. It really depends on how your mindset is, but I like having those little victories along the way. So being able to pass through 14 different states on the Appalachian Trail, um, you know, and pretty quickly. So the longest state that you go through is Virginia, and I believe it's, you know, 500 and something miles. So um, after you get through Georgia, North Carolina, Tennessee, and then you have Virginia, it kind of feels like, oh my gosh, the state is never going to end. And, you know, people tend to get the Virginia blues, as they call it. And that's where you start to see a lot of folks drop out that you were like, man, I really thought this person was going to make it to the end. On the Pacific Crest Trail and the Continental Divide Trail, you never have that like quick, you know, turn over those quick goals um, like you do on the AT. So again, that might not be a big deal for some people, but when I did the PCT, I kind of missed that. You know, had I started with the PCT though, I, I may have never have even thought, you know, um, that, that that was weird. You know, it would have just been normal to not have that. Um, and then might've even been more exciting on the AT, you know, who knows. So what about views and just epicness of a trail? Um, you're not gonna get that epicness on the Appalachian Trail. It's just not there. Like I mentioned before, you're in a green tunnel for most of the way. Now that doesn't mean that you don't get any views. You still will hit summits and see beautiful views. And especially if you've not backpacked a lot or spent much time in nature, uh, it's gonna be amazing. And although the AT doesn't have those epic vast views, there are little things about it that just make it magical. Um, but if you are going out on a through hike for the epic views, you really should stick with the PCT or CDT if that is your main goal. As far as those two, um, I've had folks ask me, you know, which one do you think is, is prettier or better? I would say that the PCT is overall probably the prettiest trail, and that's with me not even really getting to see Oregon and some of Washington because of the smoke from the wildfires. Um, but I think overall, at any given point, if you were to look around on the PCT, it was beautiful. Now, the CDT, you go through a lot of cattle country and the desert is just way more brutal. You know, it's not as, as beautiful to me as the PCT desert was. Um, but some of the areas that you hit on the CDT, just like in a concentrated spot, are, are really, really beautiful. So the Wind River Range, for example, might be the prettiest area that I've ever um, backpacked in. Now I didn't really get to see Glacier for you know everything being whited out with the snow. Um, I've heard that that is some people's absolute favorite. Um, so I can only tell you what I've experienced personally and I think that on the CDT 
there were way more beautiful, you know, concentrated areas, but the PCT was just like a constant living postcard. Another concern I've heard from folks is, what if I'm afraid of heights? Can I do a through hike? Well, with anything else, I think it's important to just kind of take it slow. I mean, people think that when they say they're gonna do a through hike that, you know, somebody's gonna hold them at gunpoint and make them go through with it. You know, you can always go home if you decide this isn't for me and I'm miserable. And, um, you know, I encourage folks to like take a little bit of time off and think about it and whatever. But, you know, if, if fear of heights is something that, that stops you, well then, you know, you, you can get out there and try and maybe you'll overcome um, a little bit more of that fear and become more confident than you were before. But if I had to pick a trail for a person who's afraid of heights, I'd probably say the Appalachian Trail. There are gonna be times in especially the White Mountains and on <laughs> Katahdin, <laughs> For sure on Katahdin. But maybe at that point you will have built up that confidence you need to climb that last mountain and you know reach your final goal. Um, on the PCT and CDT, you are more exposed, um, especially sometimes in the snow when you're going over mountain passes or maybe you're just even kind of in a tight spot on the side of a mountain, you're in a snow shoot. Um, I'm not generally afraid of hats, but there were some uh, pucker moments, if you know what I mean on the PCT and even the CDT in the Sierra Nevada and in the San Juan. So um, yeah, if I was gonna suggest somebody to hike a trail that was afraid of heights, I would say that the AT is probably your best bet. Let's talk about hitchhiking and resupply points. So I would say as far as frequency goes, so how many miles do you have in between resupply points? So, you know, I'll resupply at mile 100, you know, if there's a road going to a town, um, and then again at mile 175. So for this carry, I'll have to go 75 miles without having an opportunity to go to town. That would be ranked AT, PCT, CDT, as far as how long those carries are. The PCT and CDT though are pretty well tied as far as this goes um, and, and frequencies of places you can stop to resupply. Um, they're, they're pretty close. The Appalachian Trail, uh, for a lot of it, you could resupply every three to five days. For the PCT and CDT, I'm gonna say the average is closer to like three to eight days. Um, now, as far as how far the towns are from the actual trailhead that you will try to hitchhike from, and as far as traffic flow goes, uh, again, they're gonna be ranked AT, PCT, and CDT. It is very common on the CDT for the towns to be 10 plus miles from the trail. Oftentimes, even you know, 20, 30 uh, plus miles from the trailhead. Uh, on the PCT, you don't have that as much you know, for the whole duration of the trail, but in specific areas, you kind of experience some of that. But for all three of these trails, people have capitalized on the opportunity to sell food to hikers. So um, just because the CDT is a little bit more remote than the PCT, which is more remote than the AT, um, you still have opportunities there. So that doesn't mean that you need to send your resupply boxes for the entire CDT unless you have some specific dietary need or something like that. Um, all of these trails, for the most part, you can go and through hike. And if you wanted to just resupply strictly on the gas stations, general stores and grocery stores along the way, you can for the most part do so on all three trails. So I don't wanna make it like, oh man, you're gonna have to be killing squirrels out there on the CDT because they just, there ain't no towns, you know, it's not like that. Something similar to the resupply thing is lodging. Now on the Appalachian Trail, all along the trail from really Georgia to Maine, in a lot of the towns you have hostels. So you have kind of that cheaper lodging um, option now, up in New England, uh, up in the Northeast, things can get a little more expensive. So the cost of living is a little bit higher there also than you know in, in the South. Um, but for the most part, there are options for cheaper lodging. On the PCT and the CDT, I found things to be a little bit more expensive as far as lodging in town went. And there were less options for things like hostels on those trails compared to the Appalachian Trail. But again, that's that whole you know trail community, the culture up around the trail and the awareness of the trail. And with more traffic on all of these trails, 
there will be more businesses and hostels and things like that popping up. And it was interesting to kind of see that, you know, with the, the flow of hikers coming through on the AT, like all these hostels were like, yeah, we know what to do. We know how to handle this. On the PCT, um, there were some of those that were established. For example, the Hostel California in the Sierra Nevada region, you know, it's a very well-known hostel. But on the CDT, some of those things are just kind of starting to develop. And it was pretty interesting to see that and imagine like, wow, this is what the Appalachian Trail probably was kind of like, you know, back however many years ago when people first started through hiking it. So it's, it's kind of cool to think about. I recently put out a question on Facebook to my friends, which a lot of them are fellow through hikers, asking what made you decide which trail you were gonna hike first? Like what was that deciding factor? And a lot of them said location because they wanted people to be able to visit them while they were on trail. Like maybe they wanted friends and family to come by or maybe like Perk, uh, when he was hiking the AT, he lives in New York, so he knew that if he started in Georgia, he'd be hiking close to home, and by the time he got there, you know, he was hoping that he would have the confidence to be able to hike away from home. And so some of that's kind of cool, and just having that comfort knowing that if something were to happen, you know, you're not all the way across the country. So that might help some of y'all that have been considering doing a through hike, you know, but um, just kind of haven't gotten the the guts to you know go for it um so if you're like kind of set on the pct but you live closer to the at and you just haven't gotten that extra boost of confidence to do it then maybe consider the at because you know just having that security blanket of of being near the people that you love and who can support you if you need that but also something to consider because for example my friend divs that i knew on the pct his dad had hiked the Appalachian Trail and he grew up in Kentucky. And so he figured, well, the AT is gonna look like my backyard. Like it's gonna look like the terrain that I'm used to and what I grew up in. So I wanna see something completely different that I've never seen before. So he picked the PCT. So again, um, location may be that you wanna be near what you're used to as kind of that comfort zone, or you may wanna step outside of that and just go see something completely different. I would say that the final thing to consider would be your level of experience. The Appalachian Trail is a very forgiving trail in the way that there are people around to help you if you get in a bind. The weather is not necessarily as extreme as out on the PCT and CDT. And um, overall, I think that most people who are just getting into backpacking that do a through hike, they probably start with the Appalachian Trail. I would say that the Pacific Crest Trail will be a close second though, because there are a good number of people out there. Um, the conditions and the exposure might be a little less forgiving if you haven't researched your gear properly. Um, but you know, it's, it's really not a bad trail to start with. And if you look at the blog called Halfway to Anywhere, it's run by a guy named Mac and he does a survey annually for the PCT hikers and CDT hikers. And in 2017, he found out that 73% of the people who claim to have completed their through hike that, you know, actually filled out the survey, 73% uh, of them, that was their first through hike on a long distance trail. Now he did the same survey for the CDTers in 2017 and found out that 8% of them were on their first through hike also. So I'm not saying that any of these three trails are bad trails to start with. It's just that the AT is gonna allow for more mistakes, I feel, than the PCT and especially the CDT. Now, Aaron, the CDT was his first, not only through hike, but also his first backpacking trip, but he did do his research up front. He, you know, made sure that all of his gear seemed sound for what he was getting into. Um, I'm sure potentially editing the videos on the PCT and, you know, all the prep videos after the AT and PCT um, probably helped familiarize him with some of that. So. Uh, you know, he didn't just go out there blindly and I'm not recommending that anybody do that. Regardless of what trail you're going to through hike, you want to make sure that you definitely do your research and listen to those who came before you. You know, if you can learn from their mistakes and, you know, yes, you got to take everything with a grain of salt. Um, but when it comes to gear recommendations and uh, what's worked for people in the past, if you do some research, you'll kind of see a consistent trend and you can kind of figure out what might work best for you. Now, before I sign off, I, I do want to say there are other trails out there in the U.S. and even in other countries um, than just the AT, the PCT, and the CDT. So, of course, you know, um, research and, and see 
uh, if some of those trails would work for you also. Maybe you don't want to do a five to six month trail and you want to do something shorter like the Florida Trail, the John Muir Trail, the Vermont Long Trail. You know, there are, there are all of these wonderful trails to through hike in the U.S. and you're not uh, limited to just the Triple Crown trails. Um, so I don't want to give that impression. It's just that those are the three that I can speak to because those are the three that I've personally done. People ask me a lot, which of the three was your favorite? And I am absolutely probably biased towards the Appalachian Trail because that was my first trail. And I've asked other people who started with the PCT and they said that the PCT was their favorite trail. And I think that there's something to do with that like first love, that first new through hiking experience that changes your life. So I'm sure whatever trail you choose to do, it's gonna be wonderful. And it's gonna be a completely life-changing experience for you. And only you can really answer which trail is right for you. You know, what are you going out there for? Is it the people? Is it to find folks that think like you? Is it for the views, the solitude, for um, a certain animal you wanna see? You know, those are all things that you have to decide and kind of rank for yourself. But I hope that me going through some of these considerations today maybe helped if you are struggling between two different trails. If you are watching this and you have through hiked a trail before, whether it's one that I mentioned today or not, I would love for you to leave in the comments what your considerations were and kind of what helped you decide finally which trail to through hike. Like I've said before, I'm just one person with you know my individual experiences and this is a community of a whole lot of folks and I know that we can all learn from each other. So I'd love to hear if you've through hiked before, what trail and kind of what considerations led you to choose that trail. And then we might all learn about new trails we didn't know anything about and um, maybe there is a consideration of a trail that I mentioned today that I hadn't even thought about, you know, and this just kind of might help anybody who's struggling to decide which trail to pick. And with that, thank y'all so much for watching and we will see y'all next time.